So we're going through the book of Ephesians from identity to destiny. Basically, what you think about yourself drives you to where you're going. That's why it's very important that we rightly identify who we are in Christ. The two most important thoughts, remember everybody, is how we, what we think about God and what we think about ourselves control our lives. And so today we're going to be f- uh, focusing on what does it mean to be a church A lot of us have the wrong idea, myself included, for a period of time. We have the wrong idea what it means to be a Christian or in the church. In our culture, we celebrate the individual above all. In fact, uh, there's a song called My Personal Jesus. Don't you dare hum it. My Personal Jesus. If you hum it, you're you're a heathen. My Personal Jesus. But it's a song, basically. And the guy talks about, hey, hey, girl, I'm your personal Jesus. I'm here for you. But the funny thing is, we've actually marketed Jesus as our our personal Jesus. We almost turned Jesus into a dashboard Jesus who jiggles and wiggles for our delight. Now, that's sacrilege. Well, maybe we're doing that a little bit. In fact, we often, and this this has been difficult, we often tell people that if you give your life to Jesus, remember we taught everybody, if you give your life to Jesus, you're going to have a better marriage If you're not married, you'll find a marriage. If you don't have a good marriage, you'll get rid of your marriage. Whatever you need, Jesus is here to make your dreams come true. Right? Just give your life to Jesus. You're going to have a better job. In fact, we mentioned before that when you give your life to Jesus, it's a country western song sung backward. You get your car back. You get your car back. You get your dog back. You get your truck back. Right? And so I know I've used that many times. I can't help it. I think it's a funny one. But seriously, everybody, we we often think that Jesus is here to meet my needs. And we sell people that. And then when Jesus does not come through, we begin to deconstruct our faith. Well, Jesus is not doing what I want him to do. Now, forgive me for saying this, but I think we do this. I think sometimes the church pimps Jesus. We do. We pimp him. He meets my needs. He's here to... Hey, come give your life to Christ, and you know what? We're going to make you happy. Jesus is going to meet all your needs. That's not what it's about. It is true that he ultimately meets all of our needs. Because, you know, really, I, I'm thinking about our church and how we redefine our church a little bit more, become more uh, con- concise and more accurate. I, I would say the Lord has laid upon me in the last year, it, everything we're doing is about the lordship of Jesus Christ. He's God and I'm not. And my life needs to align to what he says in relationship. When that happens, things do get better. Yes, your relationships will get better. Your health will get better. All that is true because God's design works in relationship. And God has us here for a reason. And so I, I want to encourage you that it's not just your personal Jesus. Now, here's something else, okay? So that's the first type of people that make Jesus a personal Jesus. It's all about what he can do for me. And then there are the religious types, which I was a part of, and sometimes I have to watch out. In America, we celebrate the individual above all. We do. We celebrate the individual. It's all about my, what I want, right? In fact, you know, if you really want to know what, what satanic Satanism is, it's do what thou wilt. All about me. That's pretty much the creed of Satanism. And so we, and then I understand that. But then there's another part of it that kind of rubs off on us. We're not aware of it. It's this Jesus, it's me and Jesus and the world. I don't need the church. I don't need anybody. It's just me and Jesus. Jesus and me. My personal Jesus. Not so he can give me what I want. I love, and you you really, there are people out there, myself included, I really love Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I want to, he's my example, right? I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to act like Jesus. I want to do what Jesus did. It's all about Jesus. I don't need these crazy church people. All I need is Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I want to be like him. He's my model. My morality is going to follow him. And that's all fantastic. And that is very, very important, by the way. Key. Without that, nothing else works. But imagine if I were to come in here today, and I would be dressed up as a baseball player, and I were to tell you I'm a major league baseball player. I'm a shortstop, and I'm better than Derek Jeter ever dreamed of being. First of all, you'd say you're a liar. That's true. But imagine, though, and let's just imagine I'm really good at baseball. I go to the batting cages. I can knock it out. I'm a a phenomenal baseball player. 
And if I say I'm a major league player, and you ask me what team you want, well, whatever team I feel like going to at the moment, I go. I go to the stadiums. Do you play on the field? Well, no. You know what? They don't appreciate my talent. I, I, I basically criticize all the players because I'm a really good player. I understand the statistics. I understand the stats. I can go to the gym. I can bench 250 20 times. I can squat 600 pounds. I wish I could, by the way. And I, I do all that. And I'm like the liver king. I eat liver. So I'm, I'm really, really godly. And, 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 and they talk that way. Now, that would be ridiculous. You say, well, what are you talking about? You're not on a team. You're not, you're, yeah, you're a baseball player, but what good is a baseball player without a team? And what good is a tuba without an orchestra? What good is a Christian without the body? It's a defect. It's a defect. That's right. When you and I are not attached to the body, we're defective. We're not effective. We're defective. And I understand. We, we, listen, everybody. You know how outside we have all that smoke? Don't you love it? You know, smoke gets on you. You're not even aware of it. And it confects your lungs. And you may not be participating in the smoke, but the smoke's around you. We have a culture of smoke, of individualism. It's all about me. And this is what happens. And if we're not careful, our theology begins to reflect the culture we're around. And, and listen, I want to be, I want to follow Jesus. He's my method. But the truth of the matter is you give your life to Jesus. He, Jesus has not become a model we, we, we follow. He actually takes residence inside of us. That Christ spirit comes inside of us. I am now part of Christ. And Christ is part of me. It's not just a, an analogy. It's true that we are his body. That's why I mentioned to you last week when the apostle Paul, who was Saul at the time, was persecuting the church, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And what is he doing? He was going out to the church. He says, who are you? I'm Jesus. That's why today when we take communion, he does not define the body correctly, drinks judgment upon himself because we are the body. Now, how does all that work? So, it's wrong to think Jesus is just there to make your dreams come true, and it's also wrong to think it's just you and Jesus only. That's it. It's me and, no, we need the body. Without the head, I mean, you chop the head off of chicken. I don't recommend you do that, but if you do it, don't send anyone that I, I, I learned it in church, but apparently from what I understand, a chicken will run around the yard crazily and be active and busy. A lot of times at church, we're busy about doing a lot of stuff, but we're going to die without the head. Christ is the head of the church. We need to have the head. Now, don't get me wrong. That's number one. Right, right now, my brain, my head is telling my arm to go up and down and all that, telling me to have a drink of throat coat, which I need. So, right, my body tells my hand what to do, and it all works together. There's, there's things you don't see, and there's things that you do see. So our own personal Jesus, not really. It's not really what it's all about. You want to have a personal relationship with Christ, yes, but Jesus calls us to be a part of his body. He says, go, what does he say in, in the Lord's Prayer? He says what? My Father, no, our Father, right? Is community. You cannot, dis, you cannot take away community from the Bible. But it has to be attached to the head first. Now, a goose needs the geese. Look at your neighbor say, you're a goose. I don't hear any quacking. But a goose needs the geese. Is someone actually whistling? Okay. I actually hear like little... Ch okay, that's, that's Ralph. Okay, thank you. Yeah, someone's actually... Well, if you can do that... Okay, I can do it too. All right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to keep doing it the whole service now. <laughs> a goose needs the geese, you know, and, and it was interesting. You know about geese and how they fly, uh, and so they, they work together. I don't know if you're, it's, it's fascinating. The Bible says all creation speaks of the glory of God. In fact, God has sermons. I, sometimes the best sermons I've ever heard are out in nature. I just look around, and God speaks to his nature. That's why the Bible says they were without excuse, because the creation speaks of the glory of God. And God actually gives sermons by looking at things. Go to the ant, you sluggard, right? Well, look at the geese. You know what the geese do? The geese work together. In fact, they fly them in formation. In fact, they, they, they don't like argue. Why is he in the lead for? I don't know. 
They, don't, they, they just follow the leader because they realize that there's someone that's going to lead. Now, what's interesting is this. They fly in formation, a V formation, and aerodynamically, it's a reason why they do it. It's like NASCAR. They get in each other's draft. And so the, the leader takes most of the weight, unfortunately. And that's how it is in real life, too, by the way. It's hard. Fly, fly, it's, it's easy flopping up here. So you're flapping here, and, and so uh, what happens is, is the lead geese breaks the wind. Um, you know, <laughs> how do I say this without a little child? A little te- the first we dealt with the little children. Now we're dealing with pubescent teenagers who are going to laugh. And if you're laughing, okay, but what happens is it breaks, it breaks the air, whatever, breaks the wind, whatever it does, it, and it creates, a, it breaks the air, and then what happens, these get in the draft of it, and they all work together. And you know what they do to each other, by the way? You're going to go, ah, 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 ah. They're basically encouraging, hey, you can do it, pal. Keep it going. They're literally, I mean, I'm not kidding you. They're actually encouraging each other to keep flapping, okay? Now, it's also amazing, this is also true, that if a bird gets sick or gets shot and falls out of the sky, two other geese will follow that bird to the ground and watch him either till the bird dies or gets healthy. How about that? Do you have two or three friends that if you get shot and you're going through a hard time, they leave the pack and help you out? This is, what, this is what we're called to be doing. So really, we should change the name of our church, the Geese Church, where we break wind. <laughs> okay. All right. Your identity leads to your destiny. What you think about church leads the church to its destiny. We need to think rightly about Jesus, and we need to think rightly about each other. And the reason we see the problems that we do in our culture, by the way, everybody, is because I have not done my job as a believer in Jesus Christ in our culture. And I hate to tell you, but maybe some of us have been guilty of it as well. If you and I were really involved in our culture and we're serving our culture, I doubt our country would be in the place it is right now. Now we feel like if we put something on social media, I've done my job. I put a bold text. I put a bold post. No, you're not, there's nothing but tick people off. How about we have a relationship and change society? Your identity leads to your destiny. We talked about that. And last week we talked about this, absolute unity, focusing on our face, absolutes in Christ to keep us united. We need to focus on the absolutes. Jesus is Lord. There's no, no one can be saved unless they go through Jesus. Okay, that's our core. But as far as like what kind of music I like, how long the worship's supposed to be, how long the shirt's supposed to be, you should have a tucked in or not tucked in, you should wear a tie. Did you realize that ties at one time or another in church history, people used to criticize ties. You know why? I'm not making this up. Because the, the ties pointed to hell. Yeah. And John Calvin, not the guy from Calvin Klein, but John Calvin... The, the historian, John Calvin, who talked about tulip and all that, the reformer. You know what he called the pipe organ? He called it the bagpipes of the devil. Now we revere pipe music and all that as being great, right? So we can't get caught in these peripherals and cultural norms and what we like. I think it's wrong they had this or the other. Okay, I get it. I understand that. There's nothing wrong with having preferences. But we had to focus on the core. And one of the cores, by the way... Uh, not Bud Light course, but one of the things we want to talk about. <laughs> uh, okay, let me continue on. Okay. Uh, I lost my train of thought. But one of the core things is this. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. It's the final authority. We don't believe the Bible just contains the Word of God. We believe it is supernaturally the Word of God. And so rather than get into long discussions with people, I say, well, the Word of God says this, and I believe it. And so that's what we focus in on faith absolutely last week to keep us unified. And so the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 19 and 22, as a review, says the following. And again, the apostle Paul repeats himself like a good pastor does. You know, as Mark Twain says, say what you're going to say, say it, and then tell him what you say. And the apostle Paul does a lot of that because repetition is a great teacher. That's what he said to us earlier through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, you are fellow citizens with the saints, which is believers in Jesus Christ, and members of the household of God, that we are part of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being what? The cornerstone. So we build our lives upon Jesus. He sets the stage for us. And then the prophets 
and, they, and which we'll talk about later on, more about the super apostles. Who are the super apostles? Is that a new Marvel movie? No, it's not a new Marvel movie, but we'll talk about it in a little bit. In whom the home structure is being joined together. Notice, it's joined together. You really can't be a wall if you're by yourself. The only way we can be a wall, these living stones, all through New England, you see these field stones that come together, all different shapes come together and they make a wall in whom the whole structure is joined together, grows in a holy temple of the Lord, that God resides. The church is not a building. The church is a people, and God resides within us. You are part of the temple of the Lord. I had one once said to me, how dare they do that in church? That's not holy. I said, well, do you watch it at home? Yes. Well, you're the temple too, so I guess you're being hypocritical because we're all the temple of the Holy Spirit. If it's not right in church, it shouldn't be right at home either. Okay, so we're joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built, to, you hope you're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, that God lives within us, and we want to grow. What we basically want to happen, we want to submit to more of God's command. And listen, the more I put God in dominion of my life, the more peace, prosperity, hope, and love I have. And it's not the way the world looks at it. I mean, when I do things God's way, it's so much better. Why? He's the designer. He made us. And what happened is we gave up our dominion to the enemy. Jesus took it back. And every time you and I allow God in different areas of our lives, we get dominion of Christ in us. And that's what Christ would have for us. Now, in our culture, this is often how we look at it, right? The people serve the leader. In fact, it got this way in the church for a period of time, unfortunately, where now we have, oh, I'm an apostle. What? I'm Apostle Bo- Bishop Bucci. <laughs> and more titles there are, the, the weaker I am. Right? And so, and then I did, he even had this thing called armor bearers. The pastor can't carry his own Bible. Uh, there was a time, I'm not going to mention the pastor's name, that's irrelevant at this point, but there was a place where I used to, well, you know, I used to go to a place, we used to work at a, at a retreat center, and a very famous one at that, and the pastor would come off. And he would just go like this, and they would undress him. They'd put new shirts on him. Then they would uh, they'd give him slippers, and he was like a king. And then uh, my friend of mine wanted to fly this guy in to preach. It was 80 grand just for the airplane alone. He had to pay for the pilots and all that. Then he wanted another honorarium of $100,000. He said, uh, that's okay. I-, I wish I was making it up because it was a national conference. It all became about the leader. Oh, this and the other. Oh, well, here he comes. Now, that's, that's overkill. Or the other way, we, don't, we show no respect for leadership at all. And God does give us leaders. The leaders are supposed to serve. We're supposed to honor our leaders, but not worship our leaders. So the people serve the leader. This is the, this is the way the culture has it, right? I'm the top of the pyramid scheme, and you take care of me. Well, the, Jesus said differently. He said this. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a what? Leader. Among you must be your servant or doulos ex slave. You know what Jesus did? If you're not familiar with the story, Jesus did the slave's work. They were having dinner, and there was no one to wash their feet, apparently. And Jesus uh, took out his outer garment, tied it around his waist, got a bowl of water, and began to wash his disciples' feet, which was sacrilege. You would never, that is hard. It's like me coming to your house and scrubbing your toilet. If you really want me to, I won't. But for Jesus, I will. <laughs> Can you imagine to come to your house? Where's the toilet? Where's the Ajax? Where's Mr. Clean? All right, and that's what he did. He, came, he humbled himself. In fact, one of the greatest passages in Scripture, it says this in Philippians chapter 2, had the same attitude that Christ had. Although it was with God, did not equate equality with God, something to be grasped, but emptied himself, becoming that of a bondservant. My friends, we should have the attitude of Christ. Anytime you think you're all that, you're not. But at the same time, you're chosen by God, and God loves you, and you have infinite value because of Christ. But don't try to bolster yourself up, and I don't want to do that either. In fact, I, I, my, I want to honor a man that was going home with the Lord. A lot of my mentors have passed on this past year, Doc, Jack Hayford, and other people like that have passed on. One of my mentors was Jim Castle, one of the elders at the church I was a part of for a number of years. And uh, this is what he told me. He says, when I came to this church, I said, well, my church. He said, hey. They looked at me lovingly. He said, it's not your church. 
with his blue eyes. It's the Lord's church. You're a shepherd to the main shepherd. Don't you ever forget that. And I never forgot that. He would also tell me, you know, you're cute and fun and everything, but you know what your power really comes when you share the word. And so I want to honor Jim Castle, who's with the Lord right now. I thank God for godly men that helped to strengthen me. And that's why we need each other. So the rulers do that, right? But you should be a servant. This is what's supposed to be in the kingdom of heaven. The leader is to serve. People are served by the leaders. This is the way it should be. This is an oxymoron to our culture. I want to become so, and I told you what it was like when I went to Indonesia. I shared a couple of weeks ago how it was really disturbing while the pastor of this large church was yelling at the people for not getting, when I tried to get the luggage out myself, no, 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 let him do it. And he started yelling at the servant because the servant took too long to take the luggage out and I had to do it. That's not a way to be either, right? So we have to understand that. So the leader serves. We got to be like Jesus, everybody. Okay? Yes, we honor leadership. And there's, there is rebellion in our culture against authority. No mistake, and that's wrong too. It, that's, that, that's a disease as well. But we have to honor the authority that God has placed. And I, and, and I have to honor my position and not get a big head about it. Because I'm the front geese here, yeah, I, I get the, <clears throat> I know what I get to do, okay? <laughs> by grace, Ephesians, now we're getting to our passage today and we're going to land the rest of it today. But, by, but grace, grace is unmerited favor, God gives grace to each person. You have natural gifts and you have supernatural gifts that are given to you when you gave your life to Christ and when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. say, Holy Spirit, fill me and baptize me. God will give you gifts. There are people that have zero gifts in certain areas and they have supernatural capacity beyond themselves. And you know what? It's a gift that God has given. We should celebrate the gift in the person and thank God for the person utilizing but not worship the person. Okay? By grace was given to each, to what? What does it say? Each one, every believer in Christ has a grace. Every one of you has a gift. It's kind of hard to whistle in orchestra. In fact, if you think about it, the conductor has to turn his back to the crowd to make the music happen. And I have to turn my back to the crowd and what the crowd wants. And I have to do what God tells me and and lead the music that he has given us, that we could play a beautiful music to the world that is longing for a song that brings unity, peace, and grace. But we have to be willing to turn our back on public opinions. So by the grace given to each one of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift, it's not, by the way, there's not equity. I hate to tell you, there's not equity in spiritual gifts. Some people have more gifts than others people do. I'm sorry, just the way it is. Just the way it is. Get used to it, it's okay. Just do your part. You're not going to be judged on somebody else. One, the guy's going to judge you what he gave you one day, not what he gave somebody else. There's some pastors that are a lot more gifted. That's fine. Praise God for that, okay? But grace is given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Now, let me explain what that simply is, and I'll continue to read it. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, all of you, that's clear, right? You know exactly what that's talking about, don't you? Like, this is really, this is really practical. Now, let me explain what he's talking about here. Jesus was quoting a psalm. He was also giving an illustration of, uh, the Apostle Paul was giving an illustration of what happened. In Roman warfare, and even in Jewish warfare, in Roman warfare, when you captured your enemy... You would line them up, you would chain them, you would take the gifts of what you got in the spoils, and you would march them through the streets. The Romans would march them through an archway of Rome, and they would just have a, they would have a ticker take parade, like they do for the astronauts and the other people that, you know, like that, when you win the World Series. They would march you down the street, and they would have all the people and all the spoils before them. And now this is what would happen. When they did that, the commander or the king he would receive gifts from the people for the victory. He would receive gifts. So he'd march them through, display, we won, and then he would receive gifts. Now look what Jesus does. Not an accident. Therefore says, when he ascended on high, he led hosts of captives and he gave gifts to men. 
So Jesus said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. So Jesus gives us gifts. And some of the gifts he gives us are the offices of the church, apostles, prophets, teachers. All he gives, you are a gift from Christ. So I better treat you with respect. No matter how great or small you may think you are, you don't know the impact that you could possibly have through Christ Jesus. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above. Now, ascended means he has all the power and glory. What he did, he went and he released those that were captive. It's a long story. It's not for today. I could literally go an hour and a half on this alone. But I'm not. how many of you want to go an hour and a half on this? All right, three, four of you. And he gave, so he gave gifts. What are the gifts that got, leadership's a gift. <clears throat> when you have bad leadership, bad things happen. Do I need to give illustrations? Okay, I think there's plenty of illustrations that are out there. But I mean, bad leadership is often an indictment against the people. We get what we often deserve through our leaders. Let's leave it at that. And he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to what? To gain a lot of money and fly jets. Is that what it says? To what? Equip. Our job is to equip. When our job's not to do all the work, I heard John Wimber a number of years ago, a great pastor, Ben Ayers, California, talked about a man came to him all disgruntled and upset. Pastor, I, I'm so upset with the church. He said, what? This church here. What happened? Well, this guy came to our church. He had no job, and I, I called the church office. No one took care of him, so I had to take him to my house. Then he couldn't have a job. I had to find him a job. He goes, where's the church? He goes, you're the church. That's the, you're the church. And so we, we have built professional clergy that we're going to do all the work for you and just watch us. No, you're the church. Our job is to help equip and encourage you because uh, we're all in this together, Right? And you know what? If you supersede me, praise God. I'm okay with that. There's a lot of coaches that their players are make much more money, have much more notoriety than they do. Right? Who cares about that? Okay, what? They equip the saints for what? The work of ministry. Not just the ministry of Cornerstone. You have a ministry. Our job is to equip you to be a better parent, better a teacher, better student, right? We want to equip you in your workplace, and we equip each other. We help each other out. We help each other how to raise our families. We help each other to stay out of temptation and to grow strong. We help speak to each other. We speak to each other what God is doing in our lives. We prophesy. We encourage each other. We grow together. We're better together than apart. This is what we want to do. We want to equip the saints for the what? Work of the ministry. You all have a ministry to the building up of the body of cornerstone of what christ it's about jesus it's not about what's who's got the best church in town right it's not about that it's about jesus it's about lifting up the name of jesus and so i want to talk about the fivefold ministry real quick and that's not the fivefold you think it is uh, i had a joke but i'm not going to tell you the joke the founding apostles who are the founding apostles built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone. The founding apostles, and even the early church fathers talk about this, that there was a requirement you can find in the book of Acts when Judas was no longer around because he committed suicide because he betrayed Christ, etc., etc. This is what happened. They got together in the book of Acts. Look what they said. He says, choose a replacement among the men who are with us the entire time we were traveling with who? The Lord, Jesus from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. So in order to be an apostle, you had to be there when Jesus was there. They had to see the resurrected Christ. The apostle Paul says later on that I am I not also an apostle, which we can see here in 1 Corinthians 9.1. Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus? And so the, uh, the apostles, the 11 apostles left, agreed that the apostle Paul was indeed an apostle. They were the founding apostles. There's no more apostles that had the same power or authority as the founding apostles. How can I say that? It says that, built on the power. So we don't have this succession of new dogma coming. No, they're the founding apostles. In fact, check this out. Look what the apostle Paul says in Galatians he says this about different people coming along, okay? But even if we, 
We include the Apostle Paul and all the apostles. Or an angel. Do you realize that Islam came from an angel talking to Muhammad? Do you realize it was an angel that spoke to Joseph Smith, which I believe was a demon? Right? It, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we're preaching to you, let him be accursed. So the Apostle Paul said, hey, listen, if I start preaching things contrary to what I've already told you that's gospel, which is basically canon, then you are, I am to be accursed. And within 300 years or less, the church put together these uh, apostolic writings. These are people who are part of the apostolic movement. And we don't, the canon of scripture is closed. I don't have time to tell you how it happened. It is study within itself. But let me tell you right now, you can trust your Bible. You can trust your Bible. So the fivefold ministry, you have the apostle. The apostle would be like one that starts things. One that starts things. An apostle, he has an ability to, to hedge new, plant new churches. One that is sent. Okay, you have that. You have the prophet. And the prophet often, the prophet is not someone that criticizes things. Well, I'm a prophet. I tell it like it is. Well, you're not, don't tell it like it is. Tell it as what God says, not what you say. And anyone can be a nagging prophet. A prophet, according to the New Testament, speaks encouragement and builds up the body of Christ. And sometimes encouragement has to come faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? So sometimes we have to admonish each other, and that's part of it. So we have a prophet, and, and often, you know, we have people that will speak to our church. We, it was prophesied by Cam Colombo many years ago that we'd be a church of over 500 when we were a church of 150, and it was prophesied that I'd have a son when, uh, this, I mean, I could tell you a bunch of prophecies that were said. It was verified. It was tested by the leadership of the church. It was prayed upon, and later on, it came to be true. But it's always, every prophetic word should be submitted to leadership and the Bible. The Bible first. If it's contrary to Scripture, it's not right. Okay? So the apostle, we have the prophet. Again, we're, one day we'll get into uh, Corinthians chapter 12 and also the fruits of the Spirit. We have evangelists like Billy Graham. I mean, all Billy Graham had to do. I went to a, I went to a stadium event with him one time. It was fantastic. He just said, he's like, come. He could say, Jack and Joe went up the hill, fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down, broke his crown, and gave his life to Christ. Come forward. And the whole stadium would get up again. He had an anointing for evangelists. Some of you are really good at that. So God gives evangelists. These are people that help people come to Christ. So there's different parts of that. And then you also had the shepherd. That's the pastor. And the job is to feed and protect. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to help feed and protect, to let you know where the pastures are, that you get into the word every single day, right? And then there's also teachers, which is a part of the pastors as well. And we, have, we want to have different parts of the body where we grow strong together. These are offices. All of us have elements of these things, but God gives gifts to the church. It's leadership, and we want to see this kind of godly leadership. There was a movement for a while. We got to find the apostle. We got to find the prophet. You know, it got a little too crazy, right? But these are gifts that God gives to the body of Christ. How long do we have these things? Until we all obtain the what? Unity of the faith and the knowledge of the sons of, the, of God to mature manhood to the measure of of the stature of the fall. In other words, we're supposed to grow until we're just like Jesus. Are we ever going to reach it here on earth? No. But that is the goal. And the only way we can do it is we have to do it together so that we may not be longer children tossed to and fro by waves of doctrine and conspiracy theories he's found on the internet. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say that, did it? So that we may not belong to be children tossed and fro by the waves and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speak in the truth in love. You see, truth without love is not really truth in the biblical sense. It's a weapon. A scalpel used appropriately is a great surgical thing to cut and to heal. But if you just use a scalpel without love, you're going to hurt somebody. So speaking the truth in love. Not to tell the truth is not love. It's cowardness, and you'll be liable one day. So we must speak the truth. And if I have to be arrested for speaking the truth, I will be arrested for speaking the truth. But I want to do it in love. 
we must obey God rather than man. Speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way to him who is what? The head, Christ, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by what every joint supplies. So we're all equipped. We work together. This is how we overcome. As we can get, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow up so that it builds up itself in what? Agape, which means I don't care. I'm not looking to get something out of your relationship. I just want to bless you. I just want to bless you. This is what God would, isn't that a wonderful thing to be? This is what God wants us to be more of. 